Lecture 15, Memory Consistency. All right, previously when atomics were introduced, we said use sequential consistency. I didn't give a lot of details about the others. All I said was use sequential consistency, otherwise the disapproving bird looks at you. Stay out of trouble. There are other options, but before we get there, we have to talk about reordering as a concept. Compiler reordering is that exactly what it sounds like when asked to compile code. The compiler does not take every statement that you uh, type in and turn it into a set of machine language instructions. Uh, you know, just one-to-one -one going at it uh, as it's uh, encountering it. What instead we'll see is that the compiler can and does change the order of certain events. When you're compiling for a certain architecture, the compiler will be aware of things like load delay slots and can swap the order of instructions to make use of these spaces uh, in an effective manner. Uh, in the silly example being shown here, um, then uh, the example on the left, there might be a stall while we wait for X to be ready before we go on to doing the statement Z is assigned Z plus 1 and A is assigned B plus C. Uh, and the compiler can just swap things around a little bit and say, yeah, you know, actually those assignment statements, they'll go between the read of X uh, and the print line use of X. Uh, and we moved two unrelated instructions into the delay slots. That sounds like free performance. Um, that's excellent. You know, the compiler has taken something that you wrote and has made it better. Uh, and all it took was a little bit of compiler cleverness to notice that, hey, this is a place where I can make a difference. Uh, and then actually just swap things in a way that provides the exact same program, but better. Um, we're going to talk about compiler optimization soon, uh, and I don't really want to drag us too much away from the topic of reordering, but this is a simple introduction to the idea of compiler reordering. Now, in addition to compiler reordering, there's also the possibility of hardware reordering, and that's what we want to talk about today. Um, and um, so when a sequence of instructions is provided to the CPU, the CPU can decide it would rather do them in an order it finds more convenient. That is nothing new and exciting. Um, as long as the uh, compiler has provided these instructions that are you know, making it clear what's going on, the CPU hardware doesn't have to execute it in exactly that order. It can say, you know, it would be better if I swapped these two instructions or if I did this instead of that. Uh, and that's okay. It's fairly straightforward and at some level you don't really care uh, as the author of the program whether the compiler re uh, reorders something and then you care even less perhaps whether the hardware reorders something uh, as long as it gets done and as long as it presents the right answer. That's, however, not the only thing to talk about. And the other thing we have to consider is updates from other threads. When a thread is doing a check on a variable, uh, such as a quit condition, you know, exit the loop if quit is now true, how do we know if we have the most up-to-date value for quit? We know from the discussion of cache coherence that cache will be updated via snooping, but we still need a little bit more reassurance even than that, that the value we're looking for is the um, latest one. Uh, if a read by thread A is reordered by the hardware, so it's after the write by thread B, then we'll see in quotation marks the wrong answer. Different hardware provides different guarantees about what reorderings it will and will not do. The x86 uh, you know, predecessor, the 386 CPU, you know, the uh, grandfather of all, didn't do any reordering. x86 usually won't, except where there are a few specific violations of that rule. But ARM has weak ordering, except where there are data dependencies. That is, uh, if ARM thinks that the hardware architecture under ARM thinks that we can do a reordering, it will. Uh, or you could also think of it as uh, it's a feature. It will do things in some order, not necessarily the one you specified, and that's okay, as long as it doesn't have a conflict. ARM is getting pretty popular. Um, 
so we can't just say, well, listen, x86 is winning, uh, and x86 is the future, and we never have to think about anything like, well, what happens if our ARM hardware has reorderings? Looking at you, Apple, with those M1 chips. Uh, incidentally, I've read something about how when the M1 chips are executing x86 code, they uh, turn on some extra rules that say uh, we need to simulate uh, as though uh, it was x86 and uh, disable some of that uh, reordering. Anyway, okay. Let's not get too much into that because it's not a hardware architecture, of course. Um, so I have a cunning plan, or alternatively, I have a plan, but it's a bad one. Uh, there are some reorderings where it's easily possible to conclude that it is safe to do, and others where it's obvious that it's not safe to do. Uh, if uh, first line of code is z star equals 2, and then the next line is z plus equals 1, then neither the compiler nor the hardware will reorder those, because those have to happen in the specific order to get the correct answer, uh, and there's not much doubt about that. There's a clear dependency, changing the order changes the outcome, produces the wrong answer, uh, and... Um, Although, you know, for the kind of architecture that we're going to talk about, ARM and x86, uh, where there is a clear dependency, the um, dependency ordering is respected. There are some hardware architectures where that isn't respected, and, you know, it's just chaos reigns. We won't uh, think about those kinds of architectures. Um, they're, they're niche and uh, beyond what we want to talk about today. Okay, what if there is no such clear dependency? Um, here's an example in some pseudocode where something might happen. So on the left is the original what we wrote, which is lock the mutex for the point, then point.x is assigned 42, point.y is assigned negative 42, point.z is assigned 0, uh, and then unlock the mutex for point. Uh, on the other side, lock mutex for point, then x and y are modified, then unlock, then z is assigned zero. Um, there's no strong indication that there's a data dependency here, because the mutex itself is not a part of the point structure, and even if it is, somehow it's not you know, contained in the same memory location as x, y, or z. Uh, and that's not that's not helpful um, doing this modification because actually we are now accessing some content of this uh, Z uh, element of the point outside of the critical section, which we do not want. Um, you know, there is some state here. Uh, you know, the critical section uh, is supposed to be when the mutex is locked, and that's not okay. So what we're looking for is a way to tell the compiler and the hardware that this kind of modification is not okay. A way of indicating that you know, there's a rule that says we can't reorder the point.z statement to be after the unlock of mutex. Okay. We talked about sequential consistency only in the very broadest sense of you want this and you should demand it at every opportunity, but what does actually sequential consistency mean? It means statements execute in order, and that's usually your expectation for how concurrency works. Um, so if we have thread 1 does so x is assigned 1, r1 is assigned y, uh, and thread 2 does y is assigned 1 and r2 is assigned x, uh, then if you are executing this code and you stop it at any given point, uh, every thread has an execution trace. That is, this is the set of steps that this thread has taken so far. Uh, and at any given moment, the things that have happened thus far are the prefix, uh, and then everything else remains still to be done. Uh, and you can clearly, at any point in the execution of your code, stop and say all statements above this line have happened, uh, and then everything else is yet to happen. That's sequentially consistent. Um, that is something that we usually expect, uh, and if you're debugging, it's certainly something that you want. 
Um, if you want a different definition, uh, it is the result of any execution is the same as if the operations of all the processors were executed in some sequential order, uh, and the operations of each individual processor appear in this sequence in the order specified by its program. So, although we may have interleaving of the different threads that are executing, you know, some of them are running in parallel, and we have switching between them and that kind of thing, um, there is, in the end, a sequential order. You could say, okay, first this happened, then that happened. Uh, even if this is thread A does statement A.1, and that is thread B does statement B.1, you could say that the operations were done in a sequential order, and looking at any individual thread, we have... Uh, certainty that all the statements happen in that order. You may recall, uh, if you've taken uh, a previous concurrency course with me, we, w we would talk about something like um, the um, signaling pattern, where thread A does statement A1, and then does so uh, post on a semaphore, uh, and then thread B uh, does wait on a semaphore first, uh, and then uh, it will do statement B2. Uh, and we would say, look, what are the you know, possible execution orders of this? We would say, well, you, know, you can say that the B statements happen in any order relative to the A statement. So it could be A1, then A2, then B1, then B2. Uh, or it could be B1, and then A1, then A2, and then uh, B2 happens last. You could say it's either of those. But you never got a situation where A2 happens before A1 that is sequential consistency. Uh, every thread has in-order execution, uh, even though there is potentially interleaving of the other thread's execution. Um, unfortunately, I am not going to... Um, not going to say that this is always true. It is sometimes true, and we want sequential consistency, but sometimes it is not true. Uh, and that feels like world-breaking, where it's like sometimes time travel is real, um, in that you know, things that we thought were always reliable are no longer the case. However, uh, it is unfortunately the case that you know, threads uh, have their own view of the world, and they don't all necessarily agree. Sequential consistency is really expensive to implement. Uh, think about how much coordination is needed to get a few people to agree on where to go for lunch. Now try to get a group of people to agree on what order things happened in. When we have threads, the um, disagreement is worse than that because threads don't have the ability to negotiate. One of them is not going to say, you know, I think you're right. You know, now that you explain it to me, I agree, you are correct. Uh, and ultimately... Um, most systems implement a weaker memory model that is not always sequential consistency uh, so that sometimes things happen in an order that we don't expect. Um, allowing some reorderings can potentially speed up the program, uh, but again, we have to tell the compiler what is allowed and what is not. Uh, so if we have a statement like this where um, thread1 does x assign1 and r1 is assign y, these could be executed in either order, but publishing them to uh, other threads uh, is also a way of saying they've executed. Um, but they could happen in a different order if we haven't said there needs to be any specific ordering between those things. So let's talk about the memory consistency model. There's, you know, sequential consistency is one of them, but we'll learn about the other options today. Rust uses the same memory consistency models as C++. The Rustonomicon, book of names of Rust, not to be confused with the Necronomicon, says pretty directly this is not because the C++ model is perfect or because it's easy to understand, but because it's the best attempt that we have at modeling atomics because it is a very difficult subject. Um, People are not super good at reasoning about this kind of thing, and it is very complicated, and there's a lot of words that have gone into describing it. Uh, and at best, we can hope that the memory model is a good way of talking about the causality of the program. 
Um, and well, causality definitely sounds like sounds like something Commander LaForge would talk about on the Enterprise. And in fact, if you recognize this image, it's from an episode where the Enterprise is caught in a temporal causality loop, uh, and eventually they meet Kelsey Rammer. Um, Great episode, by the way. Um, a lot of people compare it to Groundhog Day, but the episode actually came out before Groundhog Day. Never mind that. Um, when we talk about causality, it means establishing a relationship between events, such as event A happens before event B. Maybe it's best uh, if we uh, keep away from Star Trek, in, in which uh, occasionally uh, effect precedes cause. The chicken and the egg will. All right. Um, you'll remember that we've used in the past for the idea of synchronization something like a semaphore. And a semaphore is a way of making sure that one thing happens before another. Uh, that is, a particular thread cannot proceed until something else has happened, and we indicate that that thing has happened through the use of the semaphore. And the idea here is basically the same, uh, but our toolkit is different. And what we're going to use is the memory barrier, sometimes also called a fence, or m-fence sometimes. This type of barrier prevents reordering, or in an equivalent statement, ensures that memory operations become visible in the right order. A memory barrier ensures that accesses occurring after the barrier uh, become visible um, once all accesses before the barrier have become visible. Or alternatively, no access occurring after the barrier becomes visible until all accesses before the barrier have become visible. It's like a clear dividing line. Everything on the before side of the line has to be completely finished and resolved, instructions retired, before the things from the new side of the line are themselves allowed to become visible. Now, our x86 architecture defines three kinds of memory barriers. There's mfence, sfence, lfence. The mfence says all loads and stores before the barrier become visible, before any of the loads and stores after the barrier become visible. Uh, and that can be split up into the two parts, the store and the load part. The S fence is for store, so all stores before the barrier become visible, before all stores after the barrier become visible. Uh, and L fence uh, says that all loads before the barrier become visible, before all loads after the barrier become visible themselves. So an S fence is used uh, if you are publishing data if you're writing it, but if others are expecting to read it, uh, then uh, another CPU has to execute an L fence or an M fence to read the values in the right order. So that would be uh, one way to do it. The other way, of course, is just put M fence everywhere where you need it. Unfortunately, M fence is expensive uh, because it prevents reorderings and forces things to wait and potentially causes uh, some uh, loss of performance uh, as a result of flushing the pipeline. But imagine if you had an example that looked like this, uh, and uh, our plan is uh, while uh, f is zero, we're going to spin, uh, and we have a memory fence following that, and then we have a printf uh, here of the value of x. Uh, and in thread number two, uh, we have x is assigned 42, uh, and then a memory fence, and then f is assigned 1. Okay, absent the memory fence, uh, reordering could happen. Um, the thing that we are sort of worried about in that situation is, for example, f is assigned 1 gets reordered before x is assigned 42. If that happens, it could cause thread 1 to break out of the loop and print the value of x as 0 instead of its correct value, which would be you know, 42. Um, by that same token, you could also um, end up with uh, an undesired reordering in which the printf statement uh, moves up before the while loop, in which case we don't wait for f at all, uh, and we will uh, then print the wrong value and then wait in the loop. Uh, that's not helpful either. So memory fences are expensive in terms of performance, as you might imagine. Uh, it prevents a reordering that would otherwise speed up the program and forces a thread to wait for another one. So in this case, um, it, it is something that we do because it is necessary, because it ensures correctness of the program, not because it makes it any faster. 
Okay, now the C++ standard includes a few other orderings that don't appear in this section because Rust simply chose not to implement them. We'll cover two possibilities uh, other than sequential consistency, which usually you want, um, but we'll cover two other possibilities. Everything else we will say nope and just not do it. Um, the two that we're going to talk about are acquire release and relaxed. Um, neither one of them comes with my recommendation particularly to use it. However, if you can be certain that you are correct, that you know, it it is appropriate to use in the circumstance that you're talking about, then it is okay. You can do it, and it might give you a slight performance edge. It might not help at all. It might give you a little bit of performance, um, but keep in mind that you, know, you are doing something very dangerous, and as the uh, saying goes, here be dragons. So the first one is acquire and release. Uh, and this, these are two things that uh, ultimately have to work together to be a good team. Um, so these are a way that you can make a critical section actually work the way it is supposed to. If we look back at the previous example where we were acquiring the mutex for the point and uh, we were then releasing the mutex and we wanted to make sure that all accesses to point remained inside that critical section, one way to do it in sequential consistency is you have an M fence at the beginning and an M fence at the end of the critical section and that's the way that some uh, that's the way that some implementations would actually do it. And if you open up and look in the uh, implementation code uh, of how a semaphore or a spin lock is uh, compiled, you may actually find there's a memory fence uh, that does that. However, you could do uh, acquire and release instead, which is potentially a little bit better in terms of performance. If you do that, um, you place acquire at the start of the section and release afterwards. So acquire prevents anything that's inside the critical section from moving up to before the critical section. Uh, and release uh, prevents anything that is inside the critical section from moving after it. So there's nowhere to go. Instructions that are not in the critical section can get reordered. Anything in the critical section can be reordered as long as it stays within that designated area. Uh, so you could swap the, the changes to point.x and point.z and it would have no impact. Uh, and if, if the compiler thought that was better somehow, then it would do that. Uh, but we have trapped those statements inside the critical section and they can't leave. Um, and that is what makes them a good combination for a critical section. Acquire says things that are after this can't go before it, and release says things that are before this can't go after it, uh, and it keeps everything trapped in that little area. So here's an example of an acquire release spin lock uh, that is taken from the Rustonomicon page about atomics. Uh, and uh, it is saying, all right, if we're going to implement uh, our spin lock as an atomic bool that is atomic reference counted uh, and we'll start it out as false and there's even a little helpful comment that says am I locked um, and uh, we'll skip over the part where we distribute the lock to threads but if this current thread wants to acquire the lock then you do a compare and swap uh, from false to true with ordering acquire uh, and uh, if we fail of course we have an empty loop body so we just keep trying um, and if we break out of the loop then we have successfully acquired the lock uh, then we have our scary data accesses changing whatever shared things we are changing uh, and when we're done we release the lock with store that says ordering release so we put acquire uh, at the beginning uh, and then release at the end uh, and we will eventually see that um, if we end up um, end up getting some things reordered by the compiler only things inside the critical section can be reordered within that critical section so that's pretty good um, do you have to do this? No. Uh, no. There are perfectly good locking and synchronization things that exist for you already. You don't have to write your own spin lock, um, but if you want to, you can. Uh, and then there is relaxed. Uh, relaxed really does mean the compiler, you know, takes it easy and all reorderings are possible, even ones that you don't want. 
and it's hard to come up with a good example of when you would do this. Um, however, the Rustonomicon does suggest a possible valid use for this counter. Uh, and it is if you have a counter that only adds, uh, so you know, every time an event occurs you increment it, uh, and you're not using the counter to synchronize any action, then it would be okay. So something like atomically counting requests to a resource would be suitable. You know, every time somebody calls the health check endpoint, you note down, all right, there have been 8,492,831 calls to this health check. Um, you can report that as a metric, and it doesn't matter whether a request increment uh, before, uh, occurs before somebody else's. So request 9,591's increment of the counter happens before that of request 9,598. It's all the same in the end. You get about the right answer, uh, and relaxed atomics might be uh, acceptable to you in that case. However, I'm really hard pressed to think of other scenarios in which relaxed atomics are what you want. I stand by what we said earlier that said relaxed atomics are for actual experts uh, who have a very compelling use case for why it makes sense and it actually provides a performance benefit. Um, there have been a few things uh, that have suggested uh, that atomics are easy to get wrong, and uh, I think this should not be new to you since it's the 10th time I've said it in this topic alone. Uh, and what we're actually going to take a look at is uh, consider an inconsistent state being reported in an assertion. Uh, when looking, uh, when somebody was debugging a lock-free queue structure, uh, they were trying to figure out why is it the case that um, the registers contained garbage even though it was just after a read that should have loaded data into those registers. It's hard to notice and it's difficult to debug um, because running in debug mode might prevent reordering in the first place. Uh, and we'll actually, to close out the topic, take a minute to look at the fix applied to that lock-free queue. Uh, and uh, see what code change was necessary. Popular, and it's actually something we're going to talk about shortly. Um, so, as I said, inconsistent behavior was observed, uh, and ultimately it was changed by uh, making the atomics, instead of relaxed, have release semantics on the store and acquire semantics on the load. If we didn't do that, we might actually attempt to park the thread early. Uh, the conversation on this pull request says something like this. Uh, it's, it says that signal.ready is used to guard access to a data slot, but uh, it doesn't work uh, because parking and unparking a thread doesn't actually provide the ordering that we need, uh, and memory could be in an inconsistent state. Uh, and the thing is that you know, people who work on, uh, on these things, people who work on um, Crossbeam and other libraries, you know, they are... Uh, full-time developers who have lots of investment in this, and it is actually very hard to get right. Uh, we'll see it, uh, it says, um, fixes this uh, bug. Uh, and um, you know, the bug was noticed uh, partly because um, somebody was investigating it. Um, however, the bug is hard to detect because it works most of the time because x86 it provides implicit acquire release semantics, uh, although the compiler could reorder it. Um, and so, yeah, um, you know, the uh, person who found the bug could actually reproduce it here on x86, and that is linked um, in the notes as well. But it just goes to show that atomic bugs are really hard to find and really difficult to uh, difficult to reason about, even if actually fixing them isn't that hard. You know, the uh, files changed here is, oh yeah, we should use, you know, acquire and release semantics for this. But actually tracking it down and making it work, that's hard. So I repeat once again, unless you know for sure that you are correct and you have a very good reason, please use sequential consistency.